I'd like to welcome you all here this afternoon to the second of three in Fairfield Care's series, Revisioning Our Dying. This one is going to be on being prepared for the end-of-life finances and legalities. Um, and there, we are hoping that there will be time at the end of Shane's presentation that uh, there'll be time for questions. So we do ask that if you have questions, even I know pressing questions, that just uh, wait until the end so that we can get all the material out. As with the last lecture, this one is being recorded. Um, and as once our fearless videographer is uh, completed with the editing, uh, they will be, all three lectures will be available on the library website and then also through the fairfieldcares.net website as well. So they just aren't up yet. If you didn't make it to the last lecture, then um, you're not alone. There were lots of people who couldn't make it, but um, it will be available here in a bit. So be patient and, and we do encourage you to share them. Uh, our mission here is to share this information as widely as, as possible and um, get this information into everyone's hands and hearts and minds. There are a couple of things I'd like to uh, make an announcement about. After our last um, presentation last week on uh, levels of care and who pays for it, we did get another round of information. Uh, it is on the table there for you. Um, it's called Food Assistance for You in Fairfield, and it's another layer of elaboration on what services are available for food. This may be for you or maybe someone you know, but do share this. One of our missions in Fairfield Cares is to start to work more, really work uh, to be more collaborative within our community and get more of our various services talking to each other and sharing information for you. <laughs> so that it's more accessible and, um, and more um, understandable, quite frankly. Some of it can be a little daunting to enter into. So um, there is another uh, handout there on the table when you leave. You might be on the lookout for it. Food assistance for you in Fairfield. The other thing that's coming up, this is through the Iowa State University Extension Office. They have been offering these caregiver uh, workshops. It's called Powerful Tools for Caregivers. Uh, of adults with chronic conditions. Um, this is a really lovely program, and it's really mostly geared towards caregivers and taking care of the caregiver. So it isn't so much actual caregiving skills, per se, but actually how to take care of yourself as a caregiver. Um, this next one there, I think they're just completing the, um, this one there in, in the middle of, and the next one will be uh, the middle of January, January 16th. But there are also handouts for this on the table as well. Again, for you or someone that you know, um, please do pass that around. Really good, good programs. So just wanted a little bit to introduce this, what we'll be talking about today and why. Um, I think part of it may seem kind of obvious why. And certainly after Shane's done, I think you're going to have a real clear uh, understanding of why this is really an important thing to do for yourself and for your loved ones. So, as I said before, revisioning our dying means we need to revision our living. And one of the things about revisioning our, our vision of dying and, and in so revisioning our living is engaging in the certainty of our mortality. So part of that is a real visceral thing, right? We don't get to keep these bodies. They don't last. Sorry. But for those of you who think that's going to be otherwise, sorry. Uh, I have yet to see it happen. <laughs> um, and so just, this is a, this is a, a track we're all on together. Um, but we have, in, in embracing that mortality, realizing that we only have so much time here, it's easier to actually do this preparation process when we have time to prepare without pressure. It's a whole different ball game if you suddenly are, you have a diagnosis or so a sudden change in your life circumstances that requires you all of a sudden to do this, then you're dealing with that, as well as trying to figure out what to do for yourself and for your loved ones. So this is a great time. If you haven't engaged this process, it's not too late, um, and it's so wonderful to get it done. Um, so we can, addressing our practical situation, 
our, uh, the things that we own, the things that we want to pass on, and the opportunities to express our wishes in advance to those we love. This is our opportunity here. It's both liberty, liberating and comforting. <laughs> it's liberating for those creating the directives. Having done this myself, this is, it's like it's done. It's, it's all taken care of, all the, all the I's have been dotted, the T's have been crossed, and I can go on and just enjoy my life full force knowing that I have taken care of what I need to be responsible for. It's really a wonderful feeling. And it's also comforting for those that we leave behind. Because believe it or not, even for those of you that may feel that you are very solitary, you are going to leave people behind. And they're going to be left behind to take care of your affairs. Do them a favor and take your part in that. Do your, your fair share of this and do some preparation for that. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, I'd like to introduce Shane Zussman. He is a local attorney here, graduated from the Vermont Law School, and he is now a practicing uh, lawyer. He took over David Sykes' practice and is a very practiced and compassionate person. I think you'll like him very much, and he's going to talk to us about the legalities and finances around doing your end-of-life planning. Jay. So I, I grew up in Fairfield from the time I was nine. I went to the MSAE and I did my undergraduate at MIU before studying law school in Vermont. Upon graduating in Vermont, I co-founded a social venture um, in which I acted as general counsel and then moved back to Fairfield in 2019. And I was fortunate to work with David Sykes in estate planning. Um, and I practice, I have a general practice here in town. So uh, Fairfield Cares has organized this series of presentations and sitting at the intersection of estate planning and end in life care are some important considerations that we're gonna talk about today. These include probate, what it is and how it can be avoided, the benefits of creating a revocable trust when appropriate, uh, considerations for Medicaid and estate planning, and some brief information about what is called an income only trust, otherwise known as a Miller Trust. Um, before we go forward, I'd like to say, I'd like to ask that you please take all of the information I'm speaking about today as general information and not construed as legal advice. Each person's situation is different, and so please keep that in mind. Yeah. Um, has anyone in here had experience with the probate process before with their families? Okay, some have. It's in, there's a lot of undereducation around probate and what it is. A lot of people have never heard of it, but what happens uh, when someone passes away if they don't have a revocable trust is that their estate is subject to the court process, a process known as probate. So probate is the general administration of a deceased person's will or the estate of a deceased person without a will. An executor is commonly named in the will or an administrator if there is no will to complete the probate process. And probate involves collecting the deceased's assets to pay any remaining liabilities or distribute any assets to named beneficiaries if there's a will. Um, so when property of an estate is distributed according to the will of a testator, and assuming the will is validly executed, it's called testate succession. And essentially it means that someone has created a document and they have made very clear what they want to happen with their estate. What happens if someone dies without a valid will in Iowa? Um, if a deceased dies without a will, their estate passes via interstate succession. And interstate succession is the operation of state law that governs what happens to someone's estate. It's a, in essence, it's a set of hierarchical rules that determine how the estate is distributed. So I'm gonna go through a few of them, but it works a little bit like this. If, if someone dies and has children but no spouse, by operation of, of law, the children inherit everything in equal parts. If, this, if there's a spouse but no descendants, the spouse inherits everything. 
if there's a spouse and children with that spouse, the spouse inherits everything. If there's a spouse and descendants from someone other than the spouse, then the spouse inherits at least 50% of the property and the descendants inherit everything above $50,000 in value. If there's parents and no spouse or descendants, the parents inherit everything. And if there's siblings but no spouse or descendants or parents, the siblings inherit everything. So again, this is called interstate succession. It's chapter 633 of the Iowa Probate Code. It's a very fascinating read if you ever want to look it up online. <laughs> and this is what happens if there is no will when someone passes away. There are some compelling reasons to avoid probate. It, it can be time consuming and costly. Typically, the process of probate takes roughly 12 months to complete from start to finish, but it can vary quite a bit on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, it can impose a significant administrative burden on the executor of your estate. So if you've created a will and you've named an executor, oftentimes it'll be a family member. The executor can get caught up and entangled with complex and lengthy court proceedings. Additionally, Iowa probate, each state defines the probate fee. And in Iowa, it's 2.2%. So effectively, probate is a 2.2% tax that is counted against your estate. Um, and, and there are certain asset classes that are not subject to probate. We're going to go into that. But most assets are subject to probate. And there are actually attorneys in town, several, who collect over $100,000 per year in probate fees that are entirely avoidable with proper estate planning. So this is a lawyer's look at filing probate. If you notice the bottom left corner here, this person's probate process started on April 27th of 2020. And each one of these little red or gray boxes um, is an online case filing. It proceeded past 2021. And it concluded at the beginning of this year, January 5th, 2023. So 42 case filings and over two and a half years later, the deceased probate process completed. This doesn't happen in every instance. It usually doesn't go on this long. But the point is, if you're considering end-of-life care and estate planning, you potentially are creating quite an administrative burden on your loved ones by subjecting them to the probate process. Um, so in, in summary, the process can persist for an undetermined period of time, and it can be extremely tedious and time-consuming. This is, again, probate. Jennifer had requested that we wait till the end to ask questions, but I have different segments of my presentation. So I thought if, you, if anyone has questions about probate now, I'm happy to. If someone has a revocable trust and all of the assets are in it, except their home, for various reasons, the home could not be put in it because of liens and so forth. They go through probate with the home, but the rest of the assets are distributed according to the will. Yeah, that, that would be a pretty unusual situation. So typically one of the primary reasons to create a revocable trust is to protect your real property, including the homestead, land, vacation homes, from probate. And even if a, a home has a lien on it, it can still be transferred into a revocable trust. It's just that when the estate is settled, those liens would need to be addressed by uh, a successor trustee, which is appointed by the grantor of a trust when one is created. So, so if for some reason, I can't think, to be honest, I can't think of a reason why you wouldn't transfer real property into the trust, but if that were to happen, it would trigger probate. For everything? For everything in the trust, correct. It's called shutting the gate of probate. Um, if someone has no property but money in the bank and CDs and has uh, named a person to be deposited on death, I think it's called, or payable on death, but there's no will, is that protected from probate? Yeah, that's a good question. It's actually a common misconception that if you have 
an account, whether it be a brokerage, a money market account, a CD, and it's payable upon death, that it avoids probate. And, and it, it, it immediately passes to the beneficiary, usually, that much is true. But what could happen if a financial institution received notice of a contested will or estate? They're unlikely to release the funds. And moreover, it's still subject to the probate tax. So even if your beneficiaries immediately receive access to your accounts, there still remains the responsibility to pay for any asset that is subject to probate. What do you mean any asset that is subject to probate? If everything is in those, is in those deposits, you know, those payable on death? Yeah. Is, it, so there, and nobody contests it? Um, if there are two, there are two asset classes that are not subject to probate. They're, insu they're uh, life insurance policies and retirement accounts that would include IRAs, Roth IRAs, 401ks. In Iowa, some people have the IPERS program, which is a state retirement program. Retirement accounts and insurance policies are not subject to probate. All other assets are subject to probate, including CDs. So although the beneficiary may be able to immediately receive access to that um, account, they're still responsible to pay the probate fee. That's, that, that's how it works in Iowa. Yeah, there's no probate. They just have to pay a fee, but there's no probate. Well, unless the account is less than $25,000, probate is, tri is triggered, and it, and it would be subject to probate. Sounds like to me, if you have a will, you don't have to worry about probate hey, ever. If you have a will, you don't. Uh, no, that's actually, that's actually not correct. Um, a will purpose is to define how you want your estate to be distributed. Um, but if there's not a revocable trust and you have assets that are subject to probate, which is everything other than retirement accounts and life insurance policies, probate will be triggered. In fact, when you file probate, one of the first things you do is you file the will of the testator and, and also identify who was named as the executor of the will. So I'm not understanding. Um, it seems like to me <clears throat> that if I have a will and I've specified everything, where it should go, et cetera, et cetera, and I had power of attorney, medical power of attorney, then I would not be in any situation where probate might be triggered on anything after I pass. Yeah, and, and that's, it's a good question. It's, a, it's surprising for a lot of people to learn that in fact, when you have a will, by operation of state law, it's necessarily the case that your will will be subject to probate, in, in, which essentially means court administration. How do you, how do you avoid probate? Yeah, how do you avoid? It sounds like it's automatic. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I had all my I's and T's crossed. I got living will, I got the so, everything done, I thought. Yeah, well, now, so you're telling me I don't. Yeah, it's a good question, and, and I'm gonna talk about revocable trusts which is a way to avoid probate. If everything you own, you own jointly with your spouse, including all CDs, house, bank accounts, everything, you own them jointly, what about probate then? So the surviving spouse would inherit all of the assets, and upon the passing of the surviving spouse, the assets would be subject to probate. Okay, let's, um, if there are more questions on probate, we'll circle back, but let's move forward. Just to clarify? Sure. So when the first spouse passes, it doesn't trigger probate. That's correct. Just the both That's right. Yeah, in that circumstance, when there's a joint account, if, if there are individual accounts, then probate could be triggered. That's a good point, Jennifer. Next. Next, please, yep. So to your question, probate is entirely avoidable with a revocable trust. I didn't get that. <laughs> <laughs> well, for Siri, I'll repeat. Probate is entirely avoidable with a revocable trust. So a revocable trust can be changed during the lifetime of its grantor, then becomes irrevocable 
upon the passing of its grantor. So there's irrevocable trusts and there's revocable trusts. There's many types of trusts, but generally speaking, these are the two main types of trusts. An irrevocable trust cannot be changed ever. A revocable trust can be changed, much like a will can be amended. And so um, the grantor will serve as the trustee of their trust. And what this means is when a revocable trust is properly executed, the individual, the grantor's assets are commandeered by the trust. So the trust now owns the assets. And who has the right to commandeer or, asset or um, access the trust? It's, it's the trustee. During the lifetime of the grantor, the trustee acts as the, or the grantor acts as the trustee. In the case of a married couple, it's common to see joint revocable trusts. And in that instance, both spouses act as co-trustees during their lifetime. The surviving spouse becomes the sole trustee. And upon the passing of the, of the surviving spouse, a successor trustee steps in to settle the estate. Um, one of the main benefits of a trust is that an attorney is generally not necessary to distribute the trust as a state after one passes when a will and a trust are already properly in place. So unlike a will without a trust, and if you can think back to that slide I showed you, the courts step in, the beneficiaries of the estate cannot access the assets of the estate until a certain point in the probate process. This is not true of a trust. Immediately, the successor trustee can access all assets in the trust and has the responsibility then to settle the estate, paying the liabilities and distributing the assets in accordance with the wishes of the grantor. Uh, the legal cost of proper estate planning, including a trust, is typically much less expensive than probate process. So just to pause here for a second, there are two main concerns with probate. One is it's time consuming and can be exhaustive. And the second is the fees for probate can be very high. The two most compelling reasons to form a trust, therefore, are to reduce costs and to allow your successor trustee to immediately access the assets of the estate. As an example of what probate fees may be, if an individual has an estate that's worth $100,000, the approximate probate fees for that estate are $2,600. For an estate that's worth $500,000, the approximate fees are $11,400. And for an estate worth a million dollars, the probate fees are approximately $22,400. I mentioned earlier in my presentation that there are a lot of attorneys in town who collect over $100,000 a year in probate fees that are entirely avoidable. Uh, what is the cost of a trust? Um, I, I work on a sliding scale, and for an estate that's worth up to $500,000, I charge a $1,000 flat fee. For an estate worth between $500,000 to a million, I charge $1,250, and above a million, $1,500. So I'm Sharing this with you, you can do your own analysis of what probate fees may be and what the cost of creating a trust is. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so we, we talked a little bit earlier already, but assets that are subject to probate include real property. That would be land, your homestead, rental properties, vacation homes, bank accounts, checking, savings, CDs, etc. Investment accounts, except for retirement accounts. So your brokerage accounts with TD Ameritrade, Fidelity, Principal, or whoever your broker may be. Um, and if you have a business, suppose you have an LLC, we simply add it to the trust as an exhibit. And then the assets that are in the business are automatically commandeered by the trust. Nothing else needs to happen to the business. You don't need to change anything about your business. It's just a, uh, the, its assets are, are held in the trust after the trust is executed.
assets that are immune from probate are life insurance policies and retirement accounts. This means that the probate courts cannot inquire into these assets with or without trusts. In fact, a trust that contradicts the direction of an insurance policy will not override the insur insurance policy. In short, for policy reasons, life insurance and retirement accounts are protected from probate. So we as a society have decided that it's important for the loved ones or beneficiaries of an estate to be able to access some funds. And re for these reasons, retirement accounts and, and life insurance policies are not subject to probate. You can meet your, your loved ones will immediately access these funds, no probate inquiry, no waiting period. Um, so the takeaway is when calculating probate fees, you'd want to exclude retirement accounts and life insurance policies from your calculation. So if you had a home that was worth $100,000 and no other assets except for a life insurance policy and retirement accounts, and you wanted to calculate your probate fees, you would not include retirement accounts or life insurance policies, only the home worth $100,000. One of the common confusing points that I address with clients is the different appointees in estate planning. So when you execute a will, for anyone that's executed a will, you would have named an executor or co-executor. So executor is synonymous with will. A trust appoints a successor trustee. And I, I mentioned earlier, when you create a trust, the grantor of the trust, or grantors, if it's a joint revocable trust, as is common with married couples, become the trustee or co-trustees during their lifetime of the trust. And then upon their passing, the successor trustee can commandeer the assets of the trust. So it's similar to what an executor does with a will, a successor trustee does with a trust. They settle the estate, they pay the liabilities, and they distribute the assets in according, with the, according to the direction of the trust. A living will, uh, Jennifer, I believe you're talking in depth about this next week, so we're not gonna go too far into it, except for that um, I offer as a complimentary service when I create a trust, the execution of a living will. A living will appoints a medical power of attorney or a medical advocate. This has nothing to do with the assets of the grantor, but the healthcare decisions of the individual. And I'm gonna leave that mostly for Jen Jennifer to talk about. Um, and then one final point, a durable power of attorney cannot commandeer the assets of a trust. They only may access assets that are not held in the trust. I get a lot of calls from durable power of attorneys saying, this person created a trust and I, they're, they're in the hospital and I need to access their funds and their bank is not allowing me to access their bank accounts even though I'm the durable power of attorney. And the reason for this is a durable power of attorney is not allowed to access the assets of the trust. Only the trustee or successor trustee is. So that's a consideration which you should, you should discuss with your attorney to plan properly on how to avoid that potential circumstance. So if they're different people? If they're different people. If, right. if you named a successor trustee, if you had a durable power of attorney and then decided to create a trust, you should be aware that the durable power of attorney has no access to any of the assets that are in your trust. Uh, is it correct, my understanding is that the durable power of attorney no longer has any authority once the person dies? That's correct, yes. Once someone dies, the, the executor, if there's a will with no trust, would administer the estate. And in the case of a trust, the successor trustee will administer the estate. But they can be the same person. It's, it's only if they're different that they would have no power. My sister's in the hospital and no longer mentally competent, and she has a revocable trust, and um, her daughter and my, her brother, my brother, are in the process of being set up as trustees, even though she's still alive, and they will have access. Is that, is that true? Yeah, that's right. So if someone 
finds themselves in a place of, of incompetence. Um, you can, an attorney can advocate in the court for the successor trustee to step in. And usually what that looks like is a doctor or medical professional has declared the individual as incompetent. You bring the revocable trust to the court, you show them that there is a successor trustee in place and the judge typically would grant the authority for the successor trustee to step in and become a co-trustee until the outcome of that individual is clear. Is it legally required to have that doctor's note? It, the, the judge without a doctor's note would be unlikely to award the successor trustee access to the estate. So the judge doesn't know the individual, they need to have, they need to be certain that they're making a responsible decision. And can it be done without a judge doing, making approval? Can you just set up a trustee? Yes, you can. You can set, there, the difference between a co-trustee and a successor trustee is that during the lifetime of the grantor, they, would, they can have sister. your sister, yeah, you, you, she could have a co-trustee. She could have named a co-trustee but it's, it's a little bit, um, there's a lot of trust involved in creating a trust. <laughs> what it means to be trustee of a co-trustee of a trust is you have the full legal right to access the entirety of those assets. So that typically wouldn't happen, although in some instances it is appropriate. Uh, to talk through what, what is the process for establishing a revocable trust. So I would typically meet with a client. Uh, we would talk through the legal appointees of who do you want to be your executor, your successor trustee, and if you have a living will, medical power of attorney. Um, oftentimes the executor and successor trustee are the same person. When you have a will without a trust, the will determines the distribution of the estate. When you have a, a trust, you still need to execute a will to empower the existence of the trust. But the role of the will along with the trust is minimal. It's, it mainly just empowers the trust. And so um, it's often appropriate to have an executor as the same person as the successor trustee but when there's a revocable trust, the role of the executor is very, very small. Um, so after the client thinks through the distribution of their estate and their appointees, I would draft a state document, first drafts of the estate documents, and send them to the client for their review. The client would look them over. When they're happy with the documents, we either make an update to the estate documents or if they're finalized, we'd schedule what's called an estate closing. And what happens during an estate closing is client brings two witnesses to the office to observe the signing of the will as required by Iowa law. That usually takes less than 10 minutes. And then the witnesses are free to go and the client will notarize their trust and their living will. And we'll talk about the next steps to um, finalize the trust because once it once you sign it it legally exists but you actually have to take proactive steps then to transfer your assets to the trust um, an another point is that a key part of proper estate planning is how you organize your estate documents for your successor trustee most of my clients are are typically in good health. And so it may be that they have 10, 20, 30, 40 years before, before it's even relevant and they're not gonna remember our discussion. <laughs> um, and certainly the successor trustee is not gonna remember what they learned from my client secondhand. So I work with the clients to make things as simple as possible with proper organization and I'll talk about that a bit. Next slide, yeah. So after you notarize your trust, what you, you then want to transfer the name of your accounts into the name of the trust. 
So if John Smith has a bank account at Iowa State Bank, John Smith will create the John Smith Revocable Trust and he'll call his bank and say, I've created a trust and I want to change the name of my account to the name of the trust. And the bank will say, no problem. Please either bring by a copy of the trust to the bank for us to keep on file or email us an electronic copy. And then instead of writing checks from John Smith's personal account, he's now writing checks from the John Smith Revocable Trust. And, and in that way, any assets acquired after the execution of the trust are automatically added to the trust. It's a similar process with stock accounts that are not retirement accounts. You could call TD Ameritrade or Charles Schwab. Then maybe they merge, so they're the same now. But um, you, you let them know that you, you want to change your brokerage into the, the trust account and you'll just title the name to the trust. With property, you, if you own a home, you would, have, you would have a warranty deed in the name of yourself or the name of yourself and a spouse, or in some instances, the name of an LLC. You'll, want, you'll have to change the warranty deed into the name of the trust. If the deed is the name of the LLC, you don't have to change anything because the LLC is commandeered by the trust as an exhibit. And then if you begin to acquire assets, you buy a new car, you would title it into the name of the trust rather than yourself as you're used to. So it's, there, there isn't much really that needs to be done after you've changed the names of your accounts. It's just the habit of titling things to your trust rather than yourself. It's a slight mind shift. Um, so I mentioned that an important consideration for creating a trust is organizing estate documents so things are easy for yourself and for the successor trustees. You can consider providing copies of your living wills to your primary doctor and hospital while you are in good health so that there's no question about who your medical advocate or medical power of attorney is if the need arises. You can consider using a document log to keep track of who you are distributing your estate documents to. So and if you have a trust or a will and you need to amend that document, you'll want to know who you've given copies of the old documents to so that you can let them know to rip that old copy up. You don't want multiple copies of documents floating out there. It creates the potential for confusion. Um, you can consider keeping an active list of your assets and debts on an annual basis. So what's the purpose for this? You have a revocable trust. You've named your son or daughter as the successor trustee. They're in a grieving process, most likely. Um, they find copies of your estate documents, and they don't know what the heck assets you have, or at least not all of them but you've made it very simple for them by keeping an asset and liability list. This would include um, contact information. Well, it includes a complete list of all of your assets, such as your stock accounts, your house, anything you have, and liabilities and contact information for them. So in less than 10 minutes, the successor trustee can step in, look at the document, and know exactly what they need to do to settle your estate. And then there's a, there's a supplemental document that can be used, I call it sentimental items. If you have an asset that maybe doesn't have great monetary value but has some sentimental value, maybe it's a, a photo or a piece of jewelry or it could be anything, um, you can keep a supplemental document and, and say, I want this painting to go to my friend Jane, I know she loved this painting. And it's not an official document. It's just something you keep along with your estate documents. And if you survive Jane or something changes and you don't want it to go to Jane anymore, you just cross it off and give it to someone else or keep it for the estate. So question from the audience, who is it that benefits from the creation of a revocable trust? Is it the grantor of the trust, the one who executes it, or the beneficiaries? Does anyone have thoughts on that? Beneficiaries. And why the beneficiaries? Because the grantor's gone. 
The grand tour is gone. So what I'd say is if you have a beneficiary in mind who is getting all of your estate that you don't particularly like, let them go through probate. Um, but, but that's right. I've had clients who are confused. They thought that they were going to benefit in some way personally by a revocable trust. They thought that maybe that once the assets are added to the trust, they're immune from liens. That isn't the case. The value of a trust is to make things smooth for your beneficiaries. Um, it's the beneficiaries who, who really benefit because they don't have to pay the fees out of probate and they can immediately access all of the assets of your estate without going through the probate process. Um, so just briefly about a living will, I don't want to even entertain questions about this because Jennifer has an entire presentation she's given next week. But it, you know, in case you are not familiar with a living will, it specifies end of life preferences and it empowers a medical advocate or medical power of attorney to make decisions for you if the circumstance arises. So a common uh, statement you might see in a living will is if I should have an incurable or irreversible condition that will result either in death within a relatively short period of time or a state of permanent unconsciousness from which to a reasonable degree of medical certainty there can be no recovery it is my desire that my life not be prolonged by the administration of life-sustaining procedures. In short, you're forecasting to medical professionals what you want to happen while you're healthy before you find yourself in a, in a state where you can't advocate for yourself. So now I'm happy to take any questions um, you may have at this time on revocable trusts. Okay, Shane, would you talk for a moment about someone who is intestate, does not have a trust, but has natural born children, and his spouse dies, and he marries someone else, and his or her spouse has children, and but then he passes, he or she passes, that the possibility of, of disinheriting his own natural born children uh, were you here by chance when he went over into state succession earlier in the presentation? Yes, I was. Okay, so I just wanted to make sure. I, I think that's what I was trying to I sold, highlight. I sold life insurance for a year, eons ago, uh, for New York Life, and that, we found that that was a possibility, that if, if, say, I had children, I married Nancy, uh, she passes, I marry someone else, uh, that Nancy's children, then when I pass, Nancy's children could could be cut out of the estate because only my children would be my. Uh, sure. That that's that's the point I'm trying to get at. Yeah, there there are a lot of potential variations that can arise. Um, in Iowa, if you have a spouse and children with someone other than that spouse. Your current spouse is entitled to half of your estate, and your your sorry your, your spouse is entitled to half of the estate, and the children are, provided that the spouse has at least fifty thousand dollars to inherit. So in Iowa, it works a little differently. The, 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 those are the rules of interstate succession. But to your point, there is a value in deciding yourself how you want your estate to be distributed rather than leaving it to operation of law in Iowa. <laughs> I, um, I'd like to valid, verify something. I think you said earlier that if it's less than $100,000 in bank accounts, it is not um, susceptible to probate. Is that what you said? A small estate in Iowa is considered an estate worth less than $25,000, although um, they might be raising that to $50,000. So $100,000 would be subject to probate. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, two questions, one is super simple. You always refer to spouses, what about domestic partners? Um, if you're legally married, common law in Iowa, the same rules would, would apply to you as if, if you're referring to interstate succession. Okay. Um, so the next question has to do with, you said that for bank accounts, you would have to put them into the trust. How do you handle mortgages if there's still a mortgage on the home? Yeah. The mortgage doesn't need to change, just the, the warranty deed. So even though the mortgage is in my name or my partner's name, where we just keep that, we don't, we don't even need to tell the mortgage company. Th that's right. What matters is that the warranty deed is changed into the name of the trust. Got it. Okay, thank you very much. Yep. Yeah. So revocable trusts still are subject to taxes year after year. You can pay taxes on whatever interest accrues to the assets inside it. And the question is, are revocable trusts subject to taxes? And I think you're referring to the assets you transfer into the yeah. trust. Is that right? Correct. That is correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So right now, I don't have a trust, but the bank is the executor of my will. Can they also be your executor of a, of a trust if you don't have relatives and nearby or very few? Yeah, that's a good question. So if you, when you name a will, you name an executor. When you create a trust, you name a successor trustee who plays a very similar role as what an executor does for a will with no trust. And yes, you can name a corporate trustee just as you can name um, an institution for an executor of a will. Is that answering your question? Yes. Okay. Is it possible to, I guess the term would be nest trust? In other words, you have a radical trust. And then could in that you could designate a special needs trust for a for a child uh, who would qualify for that? And would a special needs trust be set up separately and radical trust would flow with that would be a beneficiary. That could work. Yeah, um, we're gonna talk a little bit about special needs trust, but I have to tell you that's out of my wheelhouse. I don't I don't um, th there's certain types of special needs trusts that need to be administered by a nonprofit organization. I don't set those up, but yes, you can have multiple trusts with different purposes. Thank you. Yep. Many years ago, I had a, a relative who died and uh, her, her will was subject to um, probate. And it was years before we got the money, but we were comforted by, we were told that we were accruing interest the whole time we had collected it. And I was wondering if that's the case. If while you're going through probate, you are accruing interest. So she had some liabilities, and, and the liabilities were accruing interest. Is that what you're? No, the, um, the money that the assets were accruing Oh, sure. Interest. Yeah, if, if you have a CD and it's held in pro, it's frozen in probate, it's still going to uh, perform the same way as, as if it's not in probate. And, and the same would be true for liabilities. Yeah. Can you think of any reason why someone would not want to have a revocable trust? <laughs> in my mind, I'm thinking this guy's got 80 people in here he's going to sign up. He's <laughs> got to have a revocable trust. Like, tell me if you don't have more than 25 grand in the bank and you have a will, yep. you don't need a revocable well, trust. Well, you know, it's a good question, and, and there are very compelling reasons to have one. For some people, I have clients who call and they're leaving their money to charity. They, they have a relatively small estate. And really the question goes to them, do you care if the charity is, has to wait to get the money or not? And, and how does it impact you to pay $1,000 for a trust? Because for some people that's a significant amount of, of their income and, and they're not able to do it. Um, but I agree with you, for most people who have an estate of $100,000, it's worth, at the very least, considering a trust, and as your estate value increases, the financial motivation incentive to, to create one increases. And on that point, this is a common, um, a common oversight of clients. So if you have 
a house that is today worth $100,000. For sake of simplicity, let's say there's no mortgage on it, and you're in relatively good health, when you're calculating the potential probate fees, it is prudent to assume 5% simple interest per year price appreciation on the property because that is in line with the historical trends in Fairfield for real estate. Your house is very likely to be worth around 150,000 10 years from now. So in proper estate planning, if you own property, calculate in some, some price appreciation. Any other questions about revocable trusts? Okay, let's go on to the next part of the presentation. <laughs> Sad stories of estate planning. Um, Jennifer, I know you work a lot with end of life care. Are, are there any stories that come to mind for you that you'd be interested in sharing here? Sad stories. <laughs> To me, this is especially poignant because when someone has died, you would hope that their loved ones and the people around them then could focus on their loss and be grieving and moving through what it means to have this change in their lives. But what I have seen happen too often, actually, are people that end up squabbling. And this is, I mean, this, this is soup to nuts in terms of what they're squabbling about. But oftentimes, this can very much impact um, the people left behind then, because these things were not taken care of. Uh, and it, it ends up in broiling. So I, there's a couple of them I can think of. There was um, a woman here in town. She was a single woman, and she had, uh, over the course of her life, she had accrued an amazing uh, collection of jewelry of all types, costume jewelry, violin, all kinds of jewelry, but lots of it. Um, so even though this didn't impact any survivors per se, but she died suddenly. She had no trust. She had no will. So what happened was, first of all, we could do nothing with her body for weeks until we could find someone who would sign for her. To, you, have to, you have to have a next of kin, and I'll talk about more about that in a moment. So the body was kept in the refrigerator. There wasn't anything that we could do for her, for that body. And then her estate, all of this money that she had, which was quite a bit, her home, she owned her home, and she owned all this jewelry. And because there was no estate, no, no revocable trust, that all went to the state of Iowa. Now probably, knowing this woman, in her heart, she probably had some ideas about where she might have wanted that to go. But it was taken, there was no choice, because there was no provision. That's kind of extreme. Some other ones really around estate planning really do come down to just plain old garden variety squabbling. You know, wait a minute, she told me this years ago that she wanted it this way. I have a will that was dated here. It's just chaotic. So then you have people that are, you know, fighting. This is as much, this is really truly, uh, I, I see this as a, an act of great responsibility. Take care of your business and do it in the way that suits you who you want the beneficiaries to be, whether it is relatives or whether it is people that, you know, institutions or nonprofits or whatever, charities, whoever you want that to go to, just take the time to do it. It, it really is such a relief to know that you are, you've done this for yourself and for your loved ones. There are lots of sad stories. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll share one or two, and, and the point isn't to scare anyone, it's, it's just these things happen, and it's the truth. Uh, there was a client who wanted to execute a revocable trust and pass on their estate to a very worthy charity, um, and they were, at this time, 
and they had a pretty severe chronic illness and they were in the hospital. Um, and so we tried to execute the trust, but it was too late. In the meantime, their siblings decided that what she wanted for her estate actually was to leave the money to them. And so um, they stepped in and had a will executed while she could barely, and she was barely clear enough, she was probably just like, just leave me alone. Um, and, and so instead of her estate going to the charity, it went to her siblings. And it's not uncommon, unfortunately, for, for a family to behave badly. Um, another <coughs> example I'll share is one of my own grandmother. She had told me at one point that she wanted to leave a condo to me. She wanted to gift it. Um, and she didn't do it during her lifetime and she had a stroke. And she ended up in assisted care for over two years, which is unusually long. But um, instead of being able to pass on the condo to her family, which is what she wanted to do, working through a depression and very hard circumstances throughout her life, she ended up paying a hefty Medicaid bill. And so that's, that's something that um, can happen even with or without proper estate planning. But we are gonna talk a little bit about Medicaid and, and some of the risks, and you may be familiar with the five-year relate back rule about transferring property to loved ones. Um, so these are a few examples of reasons why it's, it's worthwhile to start your estate planning before things, before life happens. Okay, so the, the five-year relation back rule, are, is, is anyone familiar with this in the room? Yeah. Do you know what we're talking about? When you, it governs the, the transfer of property from an estate. And in essence, it says that a transfer of property made within five years of Medicaid costs are avoided. So if you gifted $50,000 to a loved one, and three years later, you required Medicaid expenses, Medicaid would override that transfer. So if Medicaid had a $15,000 bill, they can actually go after the person who the, the asset was transferred to. Um, if What's important to understand is that if you have a homestead, this is what people are most scared about, that Medicaid will force the sale of a home that won't happen. What Medicaid will do is they'll deliver a bill against the estate, which will look like a lien against a house, and it becomes the responsibility of the successor trustee or executor or uh, estate administrator to settle that balance. Um, so the invoice will always happen after the passing of the individual who's eligible for Medicaid. They're not going to bill you prior to passing or bill your loved one prior to passing. The homestead is exempt. Um, are there any questions about how the transfer rule works with Medicaid? I can't completely read the board from the, the, the bottom, but it says that they can't force the sale of a house, but they can put a lien against it, so could you speak? That, that's right, yeah. I was thinking about Iowa law right now, I should clarify, but in Iowa, the homestead is is exempt. It's protected from lien. So whether it's Medicaid or anyone else filing a lien against your house, they, they can't force you to sell your home. The only way your, your home is for sale is through foreclosure from a bank. Um, and so this means that the, the lien against your house will be settled after the passing of the individual. It, it's up to the executor of a will, the administrator of a will, or the successor trustee to settle that balance. A lien against a house means you can't sell it because you owe money on it? You can sell it, but the, the lien, the home will have an unclean title so it needs to be settled before the transaction can go through. So the person who buys it has to pay off the lien? I mean, that's, it, it, it's not, um, it, can, it can unfold in any number of ways, but that's sort of 
on the periphery of, of the Medicaid discussion. Um, there, so for some people, th this again is, is something I want to talk about only briefly, but it's something that I think is important to be aware of because it may be relevant to you or someone that you know. Um, and it's an Iowa Medicaid payback trust. Next slide. So there are three types of Medicaid payback trusts. Um, someone asked a question about special needs trusts. There's, they're, they're essentially for disabled persons under the age of, of 65. It's not something that I do. Um, and it's not something that I'm gonna focus on much other than to say if you're, if you're aware of someone in this situation, there may be an option for them through a trust that they can benefit from. An income only trust is available to persons whose income is more than the eligibility guidelines for Medicaid, but is not enough to pay their medical expenses. So it typically refers to someone who's entering end of life care or assisted living. Medicaid has a, an income threshold. If an individual's income threshold exceeds, or if that income threshold is exceeded by an individual, they're not eligible for Medicaid. But there is a potential workaround, and that's what I'm referring to now when we talk about income-only trusts. They're used when a person enters long-term care. They're also known as Qualified Income Trust and Income Assignment Trust, or a Miller Trust. An income trust is set up by a Medicaid applicant when his or her income is more than the income guidelines. Um, which is 100%, 125% of the median price for in-home care. If, if you want more information about this, we can, you can give me a call, but the way it works in short is at your excess income is put into a trust. And then that excess income is paid directly to Medicaid. And thereby you become eligible for Medicaid to cover your trusts. So you're taking your surplus income and you're paying it to the state and then the state is picking up your Medicaid bill. Um, who can serve as a trustee of an income only trust? It can be a financial institution or it can be the grantor of the trust itself. Income trusts have less than enough money to pay for medical expenses every month so payments are usually made towards medical expenses leaving nothing in the trust. So if you, look to keep the, number, the numbers simple, if your income exceeds the eligibility threshold by $2,500 a month, you, if you're an individual with no spouse, you would take $2,500, deposit it into the, the Miller Trust. Each month, that, there would be a transfer of that amount to the state, and then you'd be eligible for Medicaid. Um, yeah, there, there is some regulatory requirements. You, the, the state needs to be up to date on your income. You have to provide regular reports. And the trustee may have to back pay the trust if funds are spent improperly. So these are very closely regulated. I would not advise anyone, I don't think anyone would do this, but people who try to, to sort of find a loophole it doesn't work with Miller Trust. As soon as you create one, the state is watching you with a microscope. <laughs> so some common questions for income only trusts. Who do you contact for approval and yearly reporting of the payback trust when the trust has ended? After a payback trust has been set up, the trust document should be sent to the Department of Health and Human Services, caseworker for the Medicaid member who will send on the trust document to the Medicaid Trust Program for review, approval, or, or denial. So you're assigned a social worker when you create one of these trusts who's monitoring the trust. Um, and when approved, the yearly report should be sent to the Medicaid Trust Program. At the end of the trust, by death or otherwise, payment of the money left in the trust up to the amount of all Medicaid assistance given to the beneficiary. Sorry, this is, this is long, but basically before anyone can access what's in that trust, all of the appropriate Medicaid expenses need to be paid. Uh, the trust must be irrevocable or the state's residual interest protected. So this is not a, uh, a revocable trust is, where, is one where the grantor can change the trust at their own discre discretion. 
when a Miller trust is, is set up, it's irrevocable. You can't take it back after the wheel is in motion. So it's very, it's for a very specific demographic of people who are who have severe health conditions or, or may need assisted health care. And the state must be the residual beneficiary of the trust. This simply means that if there's somehow extra money in the trust upon the passing of the grantor, the state has first dibs. Uh, I mentioned that the, the threshold must be less than 100% of the average statewide charge for a private pay resident or the beneficiary will not qualify for Medicaid. So if you know of someone who may be in a situation that could benefit from a Miller Trust and you want to know the precise uh, income thresholds, I'm happy to talk with you. They, they change dynamically as healthcare costs change. Recently they skyrocketed. Um, so, so it actually creates increased eligibility for a Miller Income Trust. Reimbursement to the state must include all medical assistance and not just the medical assistance provided during the care of the trust. So there are often end of life costs that, that persist beyond the passing of the individual. And they're so strict that they override even funeral costs, uh, cremation costs, end of life care costs. In the income, this, this may be relevant, the income must include Social Security, IPERS, which is an Iowa retirement program, annuities, pension plans, and other retirement. So the, the income that's counted towards the trust is all encompassing. If you have a spouse, there is a, a variation of the amount of income that may be required to pay into Medicaid. Um, it's sort of a complex formula, but the, the takeaway here would be that your spouse will be allowed to keep some of the income for their own living costs in Iowa. So it's possible uh, to reduce the amount you have to pay if you're married. And funds, funds from the income trust may be dispersed for the support of a spouse or dependent upon the receipt of income to avoid accumulating other person's fund in the income trust. So I think most of this is, is clear, and um, if there are any questions lingering, I'm happy to answer them. To me, why would anyone want this income-only trust? I haven't seen a thing yet that seems comforting to me. It seems like <laughs> they're going to get you, you get sick, you go into assisted care living, they take all your money, unless you give them a bunch of money up front in this income-only thing, and then take your chances. I mean, it just sounds... Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I would say that's generally true of all assisted living expenses. It's, it's not a desirable situation on many levels. But if you, re, if you can't afford, let's say you've accumulated some money, you want to pass it on to a loved one, um, and you, can't, you don't qualify for Medicaid. And then a Miller Trust can help protect, because it doesn't cut into your assets doesn't cut into your homestead, it's only the income you're generating. Is that you're not generating any income if you're retired, you don't get it. Then, then you're eligible for Medicaid. If, you're, if your income's beneath a certain threshold, you're, you're eligible for Medicaid. So it, the, the good part about a Miller Trust, and I'm glad you raised this question, is that let's say you own a home and the home is completely paid off. If you establish a, a Miller Trust, your home is not subject to the Medicaid program, it's only the income that you're generating that would be subject to the Medicaid program. Uh, clarifying question about the uh, Medicaid situation. So if one spouse has never been on Medicaid and that spouse passes away, there's a trust created, the beneficiary would be the surviving spouse who had in the past qualified for Medicaid and had incurred surgeries it was going to be eventually on that person, mm -hmm. beneficiary's head, there is a liability to eradicate. Mm -hmm. At what point does that liability kick in at the time that the assets from the original trust go to that beneficiary? Or yeah, after if, the if beneficiary I passes away? Yeah, it's a good question. If I understand, I want to make sure I understand your question yeah. properly. You're saying that in the case of a, a married couple, um, one spouse passes and they have no Medicaid. Correct. So 
the surviving spouse's debt to Medicaid is not owed until they pass. Until they pass. So, yeah. so that any of the resources that come from that, from the original, from the trust, that go to that beneficiary are not going to be hit by Medicaid until that person passes away. That's right. Right. Thank you very much. Yeah. If you have no income, so to speak, but you have assets, say you have a million dollar house or something, what, what then, when you say income only or income determines, is there also a combination of income and assets? It's a good question, and, and again, I want to make sure that I'm understanding your question properly. If you have, if your home is worth a million dollars and you have very little income being generated, how does that intersect with a Miller Trust? Is, is that what you're, a revocable trust? Well, if you have a Medicaid bill, it will be invoiced to your executor or successor trustee uh, and it'll be their responsibility to settle that bill upon the grantor's passing. All right, thank you everyone, I appreciate you. And I want to give you a, an idea. <laughs> this humble looking by item could be your drop dead box. <laughs> so the drop dead box is going to have all of the things that Shane is talking about in it. So this is something in your home. I'll tell you, this is a huge help because oftentimes things can get dispersed where we don't know where things are. Like where, where are those titles to the car? Where is the will? Uh, what about that list of items that you want to, you know, your sentimental list items? You can put them all in one place. Abstract and, to your home. You what? Abstract to your your home. abstract to your home. These sorts of things. You'll want, it really helps if you just create a drop dead box. Then everybody knows where it is. It's contained and everything is in place. Um, they don't have to be a box, of course. It can be. It could be anything, it could be a satchel or whatever, but just, you might think of this as a way to um, strategize how to organize your, um, your, uh, your, your, all of your materials, all of your lists, passwords, you name it, having it all together in one spot so that your beneficiaries are gonna know where to look and, and move through things. It'll, it'll really take a lot of stress out of them. Uh, there is something here also I wanted to just let you know about, and this can be, it's called a death notification checklist. This is also something for your drop dead box. Uh, but really all it is is that it's just what he was talking about. Things like, um, again, this would be an organizer for your, death, your drop dead box. Things about um, Social Security Administration stuff, Veterans Administration. Defense, finance, accounting, U.S. citizenship and immigration, all of these things that might apply to you, drop dead box. Um, financial companies, credit cards, banks, mortgages, financial planners and stockbrokers, pension stuff, all of that, drop dead box. So this is a list of these things. There's also insurance and annuity companies, credit reporting agencies, memberships, and actually a do not contact list, which is a way of getting people off you know, from calling endlessly about that. This happened to my brother who died suddenly, and it was like it took ages to get people to stop calling him and looking for him. So there's ways of doing that, and there's a list of this. You can take them. They're available in the back there um, on the tables. So, um, and again, you can use this as an organizer for your, for your drop dead box. Um, the other thing you might want to have in it, and this is something that I'll be talking about next week, is the five wishes. We'll be, for those of you that would like to come, we're going to go through this document. And um, this is more about the actual um, end of life planning and getting your medical power of attorney set and all that. We'll go through it page by page, and we'll have these available for you then. We'll have a copy of this. You can also get it through Aging with Dignity. 
um, is another place you can get the five wishes and do this yourself if you'd like to. But this will be an opportunity to go through it and, and ask any questions. So these are things you can put in your drop dead box. And um, again, tell not only your spouse or your significant other or whoever, but anyone who you feel might need to know this, your children, whoever your best friends are who are going to be administrating this. Yeah, John? The role of the safety deposit box in the bank to yes. keep things like that, which may or may not be accessible to buy, and um, fire in general. Yeah. Yeah. You can always use a, a safety deposit box. Um, that is, of course, another. That is your drop-dead box, too. But they, their size can be limited. <laughs> My parents uh, went to the lecture like this decades ago, and so then they had all of these things. And they made me the guy to be in charge of everything, which was a shock at the moment. You know deciding if they're going to live or die. But there was one other thing that my father recommended, which was very useful, and that was one more document, and it was called Who Gets What List. <laughs> yes. And if you have two, you know, a group, a family, whatever. Um, so I made a list of all the things I thought were valuable or useful and sent to my two sisters. And while my parents were still alive, we worked out who gets what. Well done. And then when they died, it was it was not easy, but, but we didn't have to go through that under the stress yes. of dealing with the grief. So who gets what can be a very useful list. Very good. Wasn't that intelligent? Bravo. Well done, well done. And then a quick thing also just in terms of pre-planning or thinking ahead, this is a pre-planning for your funeral costs and responsibilities about how your funeral is going to go. Planning ahead takes the guesswork out of it for those who are left to honor your memory. And this, sadly, I also run into a lot. People fighting over what's going to happen to whom and how. So if you can write this down, you can have it notarized if you need to, if you have to go that far, but really the important thing is to have it clearly delineated what you want to have happen and, and who to do it. It's easier to do this before you must do it, right? Before you're ill, before you're, you know, you're going into hospice. This is not a great time to have to make these decisions. Do it now when you're feeling good. And you can think about it. You can even make light of it. <laughs> at, at the time, it's not so easy if, it, if you're pushed to the, you know, the extreme. So talk about it, write it down. It can always be changed as, you, as it needed and desire arises. Nothing is written in stone in this, but at least have some guidelines there. It'll be a comfort to those left behind because they'll know how to follow your wishes and it can be as simple or as elaborate as you want. And there are professionals to help you consider options. Um, one of the people we can talk about uh, prepaying for funeral costs. This may or may not be a possibility for you. But one of the great things about it is that when you prepay, prepay for your funeral, you will lock the price in, especially around cremation. The cost of natural gas, hate to be graphic, but the cost of natural gas is only going to go up. And so when you prepay, you lock in that price, which is really nice. It is transferable if the death occurs elsewhere. So if you're off traveling somewhere and expire, then your your prepay your your prepay will go to wherever that is going to be executed. So you, it does move with you. It relieves the burden of arranging for funeral arrangements and costs from friends or family. You can have a hand in it. I've had people that have had. It was actually for them. It was a great joy. They had the guest list. They knew who was going to be in the front row. They had, they were going to say, well, this person's going to sing this hymn, and this person's going to, you know, they just had it all set, you know, dinner tables, menus, you name it. They, they, they were thinking ahead what they were going to wear. It was like, it was like the final performance. Great. So it okay, really put it in this very positive, empowered light that they were able to do this. And then no one has to guess. 
Just like wedding planners. Just like wedding planners. <laughs> Just like wedding planners. So one of these, this is a, this, in this community, this is a big one. I really want, it's sort of like the Miller Trust thing, to understand some of these oddball um, provisions. This is a very important thing for people here. This is called the Declaration of Designee for Final Disposition. That means what's going to happen to your body. Okay? This is especially important when there is no clear next of kin. If you do not have a legal a spouse, and you will want to actually, this is also true if there, if in the state of Iowa, there, there, when it comes to dying, um, partnerships don't always count. It depends on the the funeral home, quite frankly, and how far they're going to take this. But the important thing is so easy to remedy is that you designate who's going to do this. It also reduces, again, confusion in the family, also any distress or contention. And what this does, it says, I have designated that Joe Smith is going to have, be responsible for and have say over what is done to my body. So if I want it, especially in the realm of cremation, funeral homes do not want to cremate if, if there's not a clear designation that it's okay to do so because there's no going back. <laughs> You're cremated, that's it. You're down to dust. So it's really, it's just really important to do. If you don't have anyone or you want to make it clear, you'll want to get this declaration of designee. It does need to be notarized. You'll just read through it. But it is something that you would want to have done. Um, this this has this happened not this last summer was it no when was that I don't know when some time ago there's a woman who wasn't from this country and she lived here for years and years and years and she died and she really didn't she didn't want to talk about dying she didn't want to talk about anything about her her estate or anything like that and there's another example of someone who did not do anything about their estate everything she had that she probably would have wanted to go in another direction, ended up going towards a next of kin, which they finally found after a month. He was in Japan, and they found a brother that no one really knew about. And it took, it took the funeral homes, police, everybody tracking back to find this next of kin to be able to complete this for her. So if you have, if you are in a situation or if you know of someone who's in a situation where in, this also becomes, especially if, as can happen in this community, for single people or people who have children that, from whom they are estranged, I'll be frank, or if you have family members next to kin from whom you might be estranged or people that you know that have kin that might be estranged, this it helps a lot. This will clear the way that what you want to have done gets done. So I have copies of these also in the back there. Um, it looks like we may run out of them, but just if you, you can also get these at any local um, funeral home. They will have these and they're happy to give you them because this makes their job a lot easier because they're stuck. If they don't have this next of kin clear, they have to hold the body. So funeral home, and service providers in the area, Cranston Family Funeral Home and Crematory. This is our newest funeral home. It's out on out beyond um, Hy-Vee or Hy-Vee, Walmart. Walmart. Yeah, Walmart out there. There's Walmart, La Hacienda, and then there's Cranston's. They've been absolutely marvelous. Great, great couple of guys. Um, so they they have done a lot of work for us in our community. Boehner Funeral Home has just changed ownership. I really haven't met the new owner yet. Pedrick Funeral Home and Gould Funeral Home, these are all local funeral homes. The two in Fairfield are the first two. Then there are also alternative services that you could consider for pre-planning. One is Iowa Cremation. This is a cut rate uh, cremation service, which is actually can be very, uh, not, if, you're, if you're living in means, um, the uh, Iowa Cremation will, will do a cremation. They come, they collect the body, they take it, cremate it, and then uh, the cremains are then sent to whoever is going to be the recipient of those cremains. 
but it's not no frills but it's just a basic cremation so that's an option if you want to look into that of course these funeral homes are going to be able to provide larger range of service another thing that is available and becoming more popular interestingly in our county is green burial um, there we can talk more about that next week um, about what green burial is but this is an option so this means that the body is not involved uh, it does have to be put into a rigid container and there are certain few there are certain graveyards that will receive these bodies not all will uh, but there are some places in our county where you can have a green burial if you want to have that so any questions I have three grown children that I've been very open with what I want, Good. and they know it. Is it necessary to have anything in writing because they work together as a unit, and they have shown me in many cases where they do. So I trust that they will do what I expect. Do I need to do anything legally? I say this, this is just insurance. Okay. And, and you, then they're all in agreement because they're going to probably need, they'll need all three. They, if, if you don't do this, they're going to want to get, they have to have at least 50%. <laughs> I don't know if they're going to get 50% out of three kids, but they're, they're, they need at least 50% of the family agreeing to what you want to have done. Oh, the three will agree. That's great. Yes. So you're probably fine. But, you, but just for insurance sake, if one of them, let's say, you know, two of them are out of the country or something or whatever, and you've only got one here, then they're going to have to track the other kid down. So you, you kind of need to, it's not a bad idea. I say just just take care of it. It's so simple. A couple signatures and you're done. Question? Yes. If you have your own land and you want to do green burial, can you bury that hard, rigid box on your own land? You can. You can bury on your own property. However, that property then always has to have in the deed has, a des has to have a designation that there is a body on that property, and it also has to have a designation where it is. So you're not just planting bodies sort of in the county. <laughs> well, that Mildred's up back, and then yeah, Freddie's over there. You know, it's like they don't want that. They want to know where the bodies are. So yes, theoretically you can, but it will require it going into the actual deed of the property. Do you have any information? And not in town. Do you have any not information? <laughs> If you want to give your body to science, either for using, yeah. using some organs or just yeah, donor programs, absolutely. We can talk about that next week. Okay. Love stuff like this. There's always more to learn, and there's always more to um, refine. And that's the great thing. You can go back into your drop dead box and you can change things. You can update, and I'd actually encourage you to do so, um, especially along these lines of like who gets water, you know, those sorts of things. You know, you may change your mind or whatever. It's, you can do this. Um, and so that gives you power to do it, but you know where to look to do it. So thank you all for coming today. Again, next, next Saturday. Um, so next Saturday, we'll be, we'll begin, we'll be going through the five wishes. Um, and it'll be a nice interactive thing. Um, and hopefully you'll, you'll be able to come and uh, we'll go through it together. It'll be food for thought for sure.